Simon Levin is professor at Princeton University in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. Um, he's a member of the National U.S. National uh, Academy of Science, and among uh, many organizations, a former president of uh, the Ecological Society of America, the Society for Mathematical Biology. He received um, many awards at the different scale, international and national. I will not list all of them. It will take the whole session time. I will just on time uh, emphasize and mention some of them. Uh, first, very recently received uh, the National Medal of, uh, Medal of Science at the White House from President Obama. Um, and I uh, received a prize of the Tyler Prize for Environmental um, Achievements, the Kyoto Prize for Biological Sciences, and the Mark Galef Prize for Ecology, among many others. So <clears throat> his title, uh, this talk to today is uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, public goods and, and common resource pools in marine ecosystems. So please, Simon. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And first of all, I just want to acknowledge all of my uh, funding sources. Um, I won't take you through them, but they're up there. Um, whether we're dealing with microbial systems or flocks of birds, as you see here, these are all starlings over Rome, except you can see the one hawk that, uh, out on the edge that's driving this action. Or if we're moving up to macroscopic level, uh, like ecosystems or socioeconomic systems, we see macroscopic patterns like this that emerge from microscopic interactions. Uh, just as collective actions arise from individual behaviors in human societies. Uh, and inescapably, this leads to a conflict between levels. One that's familiar to all of us is tumor, where the tumor cell uh, tumor cells proliferate at rates that advantage them in the short run, but ultimately are bad uh, for the host. Um, and that means that there's a need for scaling, just as the great achievements in statistical mechanics from individuals to ecosystems. When you go to boil water to make tea, you don't worry about what every molecule is doing. You understand that the phase transition that takes place when it boils is the result of the collective behaviors of large numbers of individual molecules. Um, and statistical mechanics teaches us how to relate those, but you don't do that every time you go to make to boil water. So in the lecture, I want to uh, address three topics. First of all, to pursue a little bit more this, the topic of conflict and public goods, to which I'll return at the end talk a bit about how to scale from the microscopic to the macroscopic, and then talk about how to manage these complex adaptive systems, a theme I'll come back to several times, complex adaptive systems, systems made up of individual agents. Public goods problems, and I'm going to loosely refer to even common pool resources uh, as embedded within public good problems, are widespread in socioeconomic systems, like the ones you see on the left, and in biological contexts, like the termite mound that you see on the right. Uh, it, it is a public good, raising conflicts between what's good for the individual and what's good for the collective. This technically distinguishes them from common pool resources, uh, the distinction being that with a public good, my use of it doesn't interfere with your use of it, but there's really a continuum between the two uh, in terms of the degree to which my use impacts yours, the spectrum from pure public goods to common pool resources. And so for the purposes of this lecture, I'm just going to lump those together. Uh, and if I call them public goods, I'm refer usually referring to both of them. Now, problems of public goods and common pool resources are obviously central to the uh, 
future of humanity and we are eroding our public goods. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, renewable resources per capita that are declining, but there are lots of other examples that I could give. Where that where, and this a picture, a cartoon really from Beijing, showing the degree to which our actions are leading to impacts on the environment and ero eroding the commons that we all depend upon. We discount. We discount the future. Um, we've done that, I'm sure, many times this week while we're here. Uh, figuring, I'll worry tomorrow about the bad effects of consuming these goods today. And, of course, we discount the interests of others. We're not yet at this state in which the person next to us as we fly from the United States to here, or even worse, to China, the person next to us is talking on their cell phone the whole way. But it's been proposed, and you can imagine uh, what that would be like. Uh, individual agents act largely in their own self-interest and the social costs are not adequately accounted for. The problem, of course, are free riders, like this fellow riding the rails here, not paying the price for his ticket. And this is all captured in the overuse of the commons, an idea that was first advanced by William Forster Lloyd two centuries ago when he talked about the commons that we all share and, of course, picked up a century and a half later by Garrett Hardin when he talked about the tragedy of the commons by which he meant the unregulated commons. For him, the solution to this problem was mutually, mutual coercion mutually agreed upon, but he meant to a large extent regulation by government. It was left to uh, Lynn Ostrom and others like her to demonstrate how effectively this mutual coercion mutually agreed upon could occur from the bottom up in small societies, like societies of fishermen. Um, the solutions to the common problems, just like the problems I talked about at the beginning with the bird flocks, requires interfacing what individuals are doing and the incentives that govern their behavior with the systemic outcomes. And how do individual behaviors lead to or interfere with the robustness of the system as a whole. So going back to the question then of scaling, the issues of scaling and pattern formation are issues that have been confronted obviously to a great extent uh, in physics, but also for a wide range of biological organisms. I can give you examples, don't we'll take the time of it here, for each one of these, from bacteria and slime molds to insects to invertebrates in the ocean, to birds and fish, as I showed you before, and to ungulates. Here, here you see Tony Sinclair's wonderful picture of um, wildebeest herds in which these emergent patterns at the front of the wildebeest herds come about not because the wildebeest are endeavoring to, to assume these macroscopic patterns, but they're the emergent property of individuals um, relating to uh, other individuals. This was an idea, actually, um, that Alan Turing was very interested in. He was interested in animal development. He was interested in his, how an undifferentiated egg with no other uh, information other than the rules that the genetics gives it and the external gradient that gravity imparts. Um, how was it that reliably or th those eggs could develop into organisms that make all of us look somewhat similar? There are, of course, differences, but most of us are born with two arms, with five fingers at the end of each arm, etc. What's the program to do that? And he was interested in showing how this could arise purely from local forces. Namely, his idea was that there were two chemicals, an activator and an inhibitor, which would, in a well-mixed medium, stay in balance with each other, but in a medium in which the inhibitor diffused at a higher rate than the activator, what would happen is the activator, some random perturbation would cause the activator to build up locally. That would stimulate the production of the inhibitor, which would start to build up, but instead of damping down the activator, the high diffusion rate of the um, inhibitor would cause it to spread out. The activator would keep going. Uh, symmetry would be broken, and patterns could result from that. And he described this with two coupled reaction diffusion equations with 
uh, the activator and the inhibitor having different diffusion coefficients and demonstrated that this could lead uh, at least to the, to the breaking of symmetry. And it can be shown this, this will lead to stable non-uniform patterns. Well, um, with the picture being something like this, starting with the uniform distribution, uh, random perturbations become enhanced and ultimately pattern forms. And he viewed this as pre-pattern that could stimulate uh, simple patterns like stripes on zebras to much more complex patterns like um, the production of, of the, uh, the, the development of, of the organism. Still somewhat debated, but people began to ask, well, can patterns of this sort account for these sorts of patterns in ecological system? Uh, for example, plankton are patchy on almost every scale. So Lee Siegel and I and Akira Kubo separately both thought maybe this, could, uh, this mechanism could explain the pattern formation in the ocean, at least on some scales. After all, phytoplankton are in some sense activators and zooplankton inhibitors of phytoplankton growth. So we took a set of equations and, um, and modeled it with phytoplankton as activators and zooplankton as inhibitors. And we got it published, but it was wrong. Um, and now, it may work for other patterns, but the reason it was wrong is for the reason shown uh, in Dave Mackis's data here along a, a, a spatial gradient. And it namely is, was that if the Turing mechanism worked, it ought to be the case that the zooplankton with the higher diffusion rate are more smoothly distributed, more evenly distributed, but they're not. They're more patchily distributed. And it was left to my student, uh, Dan Grunbaum, um, who finished up his degree about 25 years ago, to set up to understand this, uh, and his explanation, which is correct, is that zooplankton can't be modeled as just through diffusive motion. They actively aggregate. They move towards uh, each other for reasons that can be discussed. So he set out to develop a statistical mechanics of these systems, and we later followed up with Glenn Flarell and Don Olson uh, on more general models. And what he said is, let's start from a Lagrangian approach where we focus on the individual. Each individual's movement, governed by Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration. But the acceleration of a unit mass is the sum of a number of forces, some of them random due to the fluid dynamics, some of them chemotactic, but others with individuals moving towards or away from, if, if too close, or aligning with other individuals. And so one writes an equation like this for each individual and then develops the statistical mechanics of the ensemble and by making appropriate uh, moment closure assumptions develops um, an Eulerian, that is a continuum description of the distribution that only gives you the density of individuals and I'd be happy to answer questions later about how one makes these approximations but basically one develops a diffusion reaction system or actually in his case an integral um, equation because even when you uh, take the limits, individuals are still paying attention to what's going on in some finite sized neighborhood. So closures of this sort, as um, Flair and we showed later, are good approximations. You can incorporate the fluid dynamics. You can explain a lot of the patterns that are going along. Um, and there are other methods when you can't do the closures. The problem, though, is that these generally assume that the aggregations you're dealing with are made up essentially of billiard balls. That is, everybody's identical in what they do. You don't have to assume that, but the analytical approaches become harder if you don't. So I'm going to return to that problem a, a little bit later. Now, not, scaling aggregations is not the only thing that's going on. Many of you will be familiar with the Darwin model uh, that Mick Follows and Penny Chisholm's groups have been developing, uh, which has no fish, it goes uh, still nutrients, phytoplankton, zooplankton, lots of um, standard assumptions about uptake rates, uh, about growth rates, and about the fluid dynamics. Um, and through simulations, they are able to explain a lot about the patterns um, in the oceans. Um, not, of course, where every species is, but where one sees large groups, ecotypes um, of organisms so these sorts of scaling approaches work well. Um, 
And more recently, and Ken Anderson from Copenhagen has been visiting our group, there's been a lot of interest in um, moving up a level, starting to in incorporate the pieces that aren't in the Darwin model and taking trait-based, and, and Mick's been involved with this, trait-based approaches to the system. Um, and also, and we've, this is, uh, 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 comes from a paper that my postdoc, Malin Pinsky, was the first author on, which I was involved, which begins to look not, a, not just at the shifts in the fish populations, but the shifts in the fisheries as well. As we begin to answer the questions as climate change affects the biology, how does that affect the fisheries, and how does that feed back to, f to affect the fish? And this is a paper that we had come out recently in Nature Climate Change, led by Eli Fenichel, on what these shifts are going to mean for the social and economic systems, which is what we're supposed to be talking about at this meeting. It is, there are ways to begin modeling how individual behavior in human societies, whether they're fishermen or voters in a U.S. election, to try to understand what the heck is going on there. Um, the relationship between individual behaviors, collective behaviors in particular, to which I'll come back, uh, and the emergence of things like social norms. This is a paper that Paul Ehrlich and I wrote 10 years ago. Uh, and that's what we have to do if we're going to understand these linkages between the biological and the social systems. So that brings me to topic three, which takes a little bit longer to discuss, how to manage these systems. So as I mentioned at the beginning, ecosystems in the biosphere are what are called complex adaptive systems. That means they're heterogeneous collections of individuals, agents, that interact with each other on local scales um, and evolve. That doesn't necessarily mean genetically. They may evolve their behaviors based on the outcomes of those interactions, which feed back from individuals to the, to the system level and back down to the individual level. Not only ecological systems, but also the socioeconomic systems with which they're coupled. So ultimately, one has to look, and I thank Jane Lubchenco from this, for this slide, uh, at coupled human and natural systems and how to manage them. Now, there are a lot of challenges. Um, Ken Arrow and Paul Ehrlich and I had a paper that came out last year on some of the, manage the, the challenges of managing complex adaptive systems. And then I'll list a few of them. First of all, obviously the phenomena play out on multiple scales, multiple spatial scales, multiple temporal scales, and multiple organizational scales. And that means we have to scale from, if, for example, from the individual to its neighbors and to the whole population and back down. That means that the dynamics are going on on different temporal scales, making it difficult to simulate. These systems self-organize. That means that their emergent phenomena, indeed, that the outcomes may depend on initial conditions, and predictability is very difficult. Um, there, as has been popularized through the Resilience Alliance, Buzz Holling's work, et cetera, the system may have multiple stable states, that means there may be path dependence, and there may be hysteresis, meaning that if the system's perturbed out of one state, like an oligotrophic lake, into another state, like a eutrophic lake, you can't solve the problem just by reducing the nutrient inputs. The system may be stuck um, at this higher level. Uh, the first um, paper that really developed this effectively, I think, was, was the paper by Ludwig Jones and Holling looking at spruce budworm outbreaks and how the system might be driven from one stable state to another and then locked in for some period of time. There's the potential, and I'll give you some examples in a moment, but I think they're familiar to you, of contagious spread in such systems. That is, that a local disturbance may spread over broader scales and what's called systemic risk, which can ultimately lead to the collapse of the system, maybe through change in next, some external parameter, but also possibly just through the change in some slow variables that are in the system that maybe are not being paid attention to, like the loss of biological diversity. In 2006, I attended a workshop that the New York Federal Reserve uh, organized together with the National Research Council on systemic risk in banking systems. 
Uh, Tim Geithner, who was later Secretary of the Treasury, was one of the organizers of that. And uh, George Sugihara and I went to that meeting, and then he and I, together with Bob May, who was the first author, wrote this paper in 2008. It was six months before Lehman Brothers and the collapse of the markets in the U.S. It was called Ecology for Bankers. And what we said is, looking at the interconnectedness of banking systems, um, this network here, and comparing it to food web systems, uh, if we were in your business, talking to the, uh, those concerned with the banking systems, we'd be concerned because such systems are prone to collapse when they become overconnected. We said, who, said, who knows, for instance, what the present concern over, uh, how this present concern over subprime loans will pan out? Well, we, we know how it panned out, and I don't think our paper had anything to do with it, but I wish I'd actually read this paper and not just co-authored it. <laughs> um, it has at least made us um, popular with uh, consulting firms, et cetera, uh, some um, help. But basically, the idea is that complex systems that, that get too interconnected have the potential for collapse. Uh, emergence can lead to sudden shifts. Martin Schaeffer has been uh, exploring this uh, recently, uh, summarized in his um, fairly recent book for Princeton University Press, looking at biological systems, but also going beyond that and looking at social systems. And he's been interested in physiological systems as well. Are there early warning indicators, for example, of system collapse? Uh, and not only to emergence and system shifts, but inescapably to conflicts between levels. We're actually trying to exploit this now, working um, with an oncologist, David Dingley and George Pacheco, Karina Tarnita. I mentioned before that tumor cells represented a breakdown of the commons, but it turns out the tumors depend on the production of um, materials, cytokines, for example, that are crucial for the growth of the tumor. So if you could engineer tumor cells, which David Dingley has done, that don't produce these compounds, and if you could get them to proliferate, which is the open problem, um, you could undercut the tumor. So it might be a novel way, using game theory, basically, to treat tumor growth. Managing public goods and common pool resources requires bridging levels. Um, and there are lots of approaches that have been taken to this with varying degrees of success. ITQs, TERFs, um, rights-based fisheries that uh, Jane Lubchenco in particular is extremely enthusiastic about. The development of social norms um, that Lynn Ostrom uh, e explored and I'll say a bit more about and the development of international agreements. So what are social norms? How do they play into this? Well, Ernst Fair, a well-known experimental scientist, has done studies in rooms of this sort. And I, I play a game in my class that's basically based on this, inspired uh, by Scott Barrett's book on cooperation, in which what Ernst Fair did, and what I do in the class, at least in theory, is to give individuals, give everybody a certain level of resources that they can then use either to, on themselves or to contribute to the public good or to punish other individuals for whatever reasons they want, presumably those who have not contributed to the public good, but there are always those who will punish just for the heck of punishment. Now, this game is played repeatedly and everybody knows what everybody else has done and initially, individuals are selfish, but the selfish individuals get punished. The punishers do so at cost to themselves, but eventually, individuals become more cooperative and some sort of balance is reached. Humans, we learn, and we know this already, will punish others who deviate from social norms, even if it costs them to do so. Punishment itself <coughs> becomes a norm, and it can evolve in the system through repeated interactions. And so these social norms that develop are important to understand apparently pro-social behavior, individuals acting in the interest of others. For example, to sustain some fairness norm in the society. And if they're successful, we actually formalize them into rules and laws, not just in our societies, but in, in religions, etc. Here's an example. 
work with two former students, Alessandro Tavoni, who, who was a visiting student in my lab while getting his degree at the University of Venice, and Maya Schluter, um, who was a postdoc with me. Um, Alessandro is at the London School of Economics now, and Maya is at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Maya worked on water withdrawal systems in Uzbekistan, uh, but the paper we developed was, could have been directed towards that, but we were really thinking more about fisheries, and we continue to work on this. It was inspired by Lynn Ostrom, and the idea is you had a resource, and individuals could withdraw the, from that resource either at the socially beneficial optimal rate, or they could withdraw at a much more selfish rate uh, that benefited them but helped destroy the resource. And the idea was, uh, forget this term for just a moment, that depending on their effort level, and this is the resource level, which is governed by uh, this equation at the bottom, capital E is the total effort of all individuals, the cooperators would get a certain payoff that depended on their resource level, and the defectors, that is those who did not follow the social norm, would withdraw at a higher rate and therefore would get a higher payoff. But they would end up being punished, uh, and this is the degree to which they're punished. It depended upon how selfish they were. And this is the critical function, the so-called ostracism function, which is a function of the number of cooperators. So the idea is the cooperators all get together and, uh, and punish the defectors. So the more cooperators you have, the more effective this is. We're doing further work now in which, and we've done work and published it in which the resource level fluctuates independently, uh, on which there is a more specific cost to individuals uh, for punishing, and in which, and this is work largely of my student Andrew Tillman, um, in, in which one doesn't only compare withdrawing at the optimal rate, which sometimes that doesn't work, and at this high defective rate, rate, but asks, is there what an economist would term a second best solution in which you preserve the resource better than you would uh, at the defectors rate, but not as well as would be optimal collectively. So what we do is we, depending on, on whether we're consuming a finite or infinite population, we either assume a Moran uh, model or what's called a replicator equation, but, but both of those mean is we put the cooperators and the defectors into competition with each other, reward them based on their payoffs, and see how the system will evolve. And we do so for a variety of different levels, levels of defection. 1.0 would be no defection at all. This is how much more the defectors take than the cooperators. And in general, what we find is that there are two solutions. There's a solution in which cooperation fails, but then if you can get above a critical number of cooperators, then you can converge to a cooperative solution. This is the way a lot of international agreements are structured uh, as well. You've got to get the number of signatory nations above a certain level. So the trick is getting these cooperative regimes to evolve. This involves collective decision making. So the last thing I want to talk about is how collective decision making uh, is made whether we're dealing with those bird flocks I showed you at the beginning or with human societies. This is work that I began. I've been interested in bird flocks uh, for many years, but it didn't do much with it until I got a terrific postdoc, Ian Cousin, who later became a colleague and now directs a Max Planck Institute. And our first paper on this was published in 2005, in which we looked at animal groups in particular fish schools, in which Ian does um, experimental work, to look at the, what the trade-offs are between leaders and followers. So we, we went back to the Lagrangian models that Danny looked at, but now it's an agent-based model. Every individual has their own set of rules in terms of the degree to which they follow their own information and the degree to which they follow others and that those are evolvable traits. And so the model looks like this. Every individual's got a vector, which is the direction it's going. Every individual updates its movement uh, 
based on its own information, G, and some information about its neighbors, whether it's their positions or their velocities. And in the first video I'll show you here, there are 100 individuals, but only one of them has any idea where to go. Uh, and that's up to here. That's the white dot. And it can't convince anybody to go with it, and so nothing much happens. But if I increase that one to five, then those eventually get together at the front and haltingly lead the group. And if we raise that to 10, then the group moves quite effectively towards its goal. Uh, and this is all work with Ian and led by Ian. And what we see from that is that animal groups can be led by a very small number of individuals. These are groups of different sizes. This is the proportion of informed individuals. This is how effectively they move towards the goal. This is the larger group. It's actually more instructive to look just at the number rather than the proportion of, in, of informed individuals because then by the time you get up to five or 10 individuals, the group moves quite effectively towards the front. But what if not everybody who's got their own ideas knows which direction they want to go? Uh, one possibility here, five individuals want to go there and five here. The group fools around for a while uh, it, and then it splits. The group splits apart. So how do we get consensus? Um, and if we get consensus, what determines which way the group goes? So we've been doing a lot of work on that with analytical models. I'm not going to take you through that. Um, by the way, another possibility is that the group actually never settles but goes back and forth uh, between goals. So one of the things that um, we, we've extended this model in various ways, looking at more complex patterns such as the ones that you see on the right there, embedding this in an evolutionary framework to look at the conflict between what individuals are doing and what the group needs to do. Uh, this goes back to the old behavioral ecology distinction between producers and scroungers. Gathering information is necessary for the group, but it's costly. So how do groups evolve this behavior? And we've been looking a lot at that. Um, but what I want to talk about now is the role of the unopinionated, because I showed you movies in which five individuals want to go north, five want to go south, but there are 90 that are basically unopinionated and are just following other individuals. What's the trade-off? And so we've looked a lot at, depends on how strongly the opinions are held within the groups. But we've investigated this from multiple angles. We've explored this model and analytical versions of it. Uh, Ian's done experimental studies with fish in which he trains fish to targets. Um, th these are the simulation models I just referred to. And we've also looked at the literature, some of which I showed you before, on human collective decision making. And in all of these, we see the same outcome, not a surprising outcome, uh, we discussed this in a paper five years ago um, that appeared in Science that said that um, uninformed individuals promote democratic consensus in animal groups. And basically what that meant is that the unopinionated individuals, the individuals who are basically followers, are the glue that holds the group together. Without it, consensus is almost impossible. And they also provide great momentum. And so you can get sudden shifts in group, and we see that, of course, in human societies. Going back to the problem I raised at the beginning about not just the U.S. elections, you could look at Brexit in the, in the U.K., you can look at any elections over here. There may be sudden shifts in attitude and opinions that are very difficult to explain. Much of it has to do with the independents, the uninformed individuals, very few decision makers in the society. So theoretically, and empirically, the unopinionated individuals are crucial to the nature of consensus and to the sudden shift in norms. And we've seen this over and over again. Uh, in the US, for example, with uh, gender equality, with racial equality, with smoking in public, with a recent controversy some of you may have seen about the Confederate flag being flown on state houses. The question is, how will this affect our ability to get consensus on um, doing something about climate change? Attitudinal shifts affect action, and uh, in human societies there may be very few leaders and many followers, sudden shifts, and we've got to take that into account in dealing with these environmental problems. So, let me finish. Um, the, the question 
still before us is how do we extend Lynn Ostrom's approaches and the approaches that we explored in fishermen societies to the global levels? Can we do that? Um, in dealing with climate change, one of the last papers Lynn published before she died was on polycentric approaches for dealing with climate change, by which she meant looking at the subdivision of the 200 nations into smaller sets of them that could reach agreements that could be building blocks. Um, and this idea is very close to um, what's sometimes called the uh, club's approach in economics. So Avinash Dixit, an economist and game theorist at Princeton and I, have been looking at the dynamics of such systems where there are multiple groups asking under what conditions individuals will contribute to the public good. And pro-sociality is a very important part of this. With George Pacheco and with two students, Phil Hannum and Vitor Vizconsolitz, uh, I think this paper has actually appeared now. This is a somewhat dated slide. We've been trying to build on this to develop mathematical models. And I won't take you through the model, but I'll give you an idea of the essence of it. So the idea is that nations can belong to a variety of clubs. And these are overlapping. For, for example, France belongs to NATO, it belongs to various uh, to WHO and to other organizations, all of which deal with different issues, all of which bring different nations together. That's all incorporated in this model. But the idea is your action on an issue like climate change and whether you're going to mitigate will depend not just on, the, on the, any particular group you're in, but on all of your interlocking associations and your own selfish interests. So within this model, we have groups, and that's this middle thing in, to which, like NATO, and to which nations belong. You can either be a member of that group, and it costs you something to belong, but you get certain benefits from being in the group. And there are outsiders who pay no cost and get but still may get some benefits from overflow um, if we solve the climate change problem that's still going to help the countries that um, are not members of that club. Um, and then within that club, there are those who may reach agreement, for example, on mitigating against climate change. So cooperators pay the full cost. Members of the group who are not mitigating just pay the base cost. Outsiders pay nothing. And again, we set up a game theoretic model, just like we did for the um, ostracism example, in which uh, individuals join or don't join groups, mitigate or don't mitigate. And we demonstrate that this can lead to cooperation where you couldn't get it otherwise, that this is enhanced by the overlapping uh, of groups, and that, of course, there is a collective benefit uh, to everybody if some subset agrees. So I think there's some potential for models of this sort. So ecological systems and socioeconomic systems alike are complex adaptive systems. Can cooperation be extended to the global level? Well, if you look back either in the ecological literature or socio, certainly in the socio and economic literature, we see cooperation, but too often it's cooperation that has evolved for the benefit of conflict with other groups. Um, in the global commons, there is no other. As Pogo, a uh, comic strip character from my youth, and probably from the youth of two or three of you, said, uh, um, looking around, we have met the enemy, uh, and he is us. To understand how to achieve international cooperation, uh, if we're going to do it, we're going to have to recognize that uh, our enemies are not each other, but environmental degradation, a common enemy. And that's going to be essential if we're going to achieve a sustainable future for our children and for our grandchildren. Thank you very much.